She was a nice lady who would make sure that um, I not only concentrated in class, but I had to be disciplined. And one of the things she basically always did was to ensure that I was neat and she would always comb my hair. And with a black kinky hair, I hated my hair being combed. She would hold me tightly and comb my hair. I cry in class. But that helped me focus so much. And in no time, I was the best student in class. I was told never to use disability as an excuse. Therefore, I worked hard. I was one of the best. The turning point came when I prepared so hard for a competition like this, a national contest. I studied very hard. The results were in. Yes, I made it. I was on the school list to represent my region. The next day, the teachers called me to the, class, to the principal's office. David, we have news for you. Sorry, you cannot be part of the team because it's going to be difficult for you to move around when we get to the national stage. But I thought I was told that disability should never be an excuse. But today, I am facing the realities of the fact that I am being left out of the team, not because of my incompetence, but simply because I am disabled. And this was the beginning of my understanding of exclusion. So today, this topic is not just a matter of uh, academic interest for us, but it's a painful, important reality that people like me and the in different parts of the world face. And we, I begin with uh, a radical Marxist philosopher who says that each generation must deal with the problems that they face. And in our case, we have come to realize that poverty is one of it. We have dealt with challenges such as co colonialism, women's rights to vote, and things like that. And in our world today, we have come to realize that poverty is not just something that we have to deal with, but we can overcome. And we are the generation that will be able to overcome. So my question then is, what is poverty? It is powerlessness, it is indignity, and deprivation from my personal experience and the experience of many others. So beautifully, when the Millennium Declaration comes out to say we're going to fight poverty, then I begin to look and say, yes, at last this is it. But like what my teachers told me in school, I looked at the Millennium Declaration about poverty. I don't see disabled people there. And it begins to sound okay by implication. Then the World Bank president says, the MDGs cannot be, acquired, cannot be achieved as long as disabled people are left out. Then my question is, how come all this started without even factoring in disability in the first place? So that speaks clearly to the question of exclusion at its core. And uh, we're going to look at some of the quick facts about uh, poverty. And we said that poverty rates have been halved all around the world, and 700 million fewer people are now poor. And economic and financial conditions have also widened the gap and uh, a global jobs gap, which is about 67 million people. Next. Next. Skip, skip, skip. Yeah. More. Next one. Yes. So the UN Secretary General's high-level panel, I looked at it, and it was very fascinating for me on several accounts. It says that the MDGs did not focus enough on reaching the very poorest and most excluded people. So who are they? That's the question I keep asking. And Robert Zolich says, well, it is people like me who are disabled that have not been factored into the whole concept of dealing with this, uh, addressing poverty um, on a universal scale. And next one. And even among poor people, when you ask poor people, they say, oh, the disabled people are the poorest among the poor. But we are not featured in there. And we look at the statistics, they are really very staggering, which says about 80 million people around the world are disabled in one form or the other. And we go further, it's the, uh, the World Health Organization says 15% of the world's population are disabled, but yet we don't see that in there. So we see the, and most interesting part of it is that there are millions of disabled people in very excluded parts of the world that are not even documented and therefore statistically unaccounted for. So in my experience and looking around the world, I've come to see that disability reinforces exclusion and brings, drives down to poverty. And therefore, disability and poverty have a joint relationship. It is both a cause of poverty. If you are disabled, you are likely to be poor. And if you are poor, you are very, very likely to be disabled. Next. So at this stage, I would like to hand over to my colleague, my little sister here to take over. Thank you. Um... One of the difficulties with disability is getting a firm grip of what it actually is and what it is not. 
You and I have been made to believe for a very long time what disability is not, especially by looking at the medical model of conceptualizing disability, which focuses on only correcting the wrong in the person and nothing other else and nothing else that has to do with his or her surroundings. Meanwhile, there are two perspectives of conceptualizing disability. That's the medical model and the social model. Uh, building on the medical model, disabled activists all over the world, especially the union, uh, the union of the physical impaired against segregation in Britain, they have come out to give out clear and distinguishing concepts to understand disability, that is with impairment and disability. And they, quote, they define disability, physical impairment, as a lacking part of or all of a limb or having a defective limb, organism, or mechanism of the body. And disability as a disadvantage of people who have physical impairment and thus exclude from the mainstream social activities. We can see from this picture that this lady has a physical impairment, but she is also disabled in the sense that though she has a wheelchair, which meets her mobility issue, she still cannot move around because the facilities around her will not give her the chance to move around. So with this, we can easily conclude that disability is a social creation. The physical impairment is not the problem, but the social conditions around the physically impaired person is the problem. So how does society deal with disability? Building on the uh, medical model, there are two simple ways. That is rehabilitation, to correct the wrong in the person, and continuous caregiving, like what was given to my brother. What's the problem with uh, disabled people? Is the way they are treated less than humans. And uh, this is seen on the cultural level and even in the national level. When governments decide to do something about it, it's not all about meeting the social conditions, but just in a way of making national policies that will favor the majority and leaving them out. Another problem with disability is personalizing it. A scholar, Michael Oliver, once said that in order to get disabled people into mainstream society, there is a need to use the social model. And the social model encourages the disabled person to think in this way. What is wrong with society? What, is social, what social, economic, or political conditions need to be changed in order to make life comfortable for everybody, whether disabled or not? Secondly, he also goes ahead to challenge disabled people to look at the world in another view by asking, especially with a person who is impaired, am I not, am, is it difficult for me to understand people because I am deaf? Or is it difficult for me to understand people because they are not able to communicate with me? This gives us another opportunity to view disability not only from the medical model, but also from the social model, which gives us a chance to include disabled people to participate politically, socially, and all aspects of society. Um, this picture also shows another disabled person who is fully equipped with a, a moving device, but unfortunately, he's still not independent because the society still needs him to get somebody to give him care, even in the midst of um, other facilities that are available for other people. The UN Convention on the Rights of Person in uh, 32 with the UNCRPD describes disability as a pathology of society. This implies that the UN also accepts that disability is not the problem of the person, the victim, or the person suffering it, but it's rather a consequence of what society has done or has not done in order to include this person into mainstream society. I'll now hand over to Mr. David Alenga to continue with the rest. Yes, so from now we're going to look at what do we know about the whole idea of disability and its relation to poverty. Go ahead. 
Yeah, the most pressing challenges for us persons with disabilities, if you talk to us, it's not our disability, but it has to do with the poverty. It has to do with the exclusion. So if all these elements are corrected, then we come to realize that it's a different situation altogether. And the vicious cycle that exclusion exposes, it reinforces poverty and disability because the, poor you, the, uh, the more disabled you are, the poorer you are, you get. And one of the things the UK's Department for International Development says that uh, for us to be able to address the MDGs, we need to look at challenging exclusion, which has to be central to reducing and meeting the MDGs. Millennium Development Goals, which are not back, back one, 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 previous one. Yeah, and Article 32 of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities says all development programs must be inclusive of and accessible to persons with disabilities. So there is the global framework and the global mechanism for which these things have to be uh, have to operate and be, uh, have to be functional and implemented. So the, me, in any case, we are also aware that progress has been made to some extent. And the uh, Secretary General's higher level panel of eminent persons uh, did also recognize some of the issues that were missing, conspicuous gaps that were missing in the MDGs to be factored into the post-24. One of the critical parts that I find so, we find so interesting is the fact that it says no one should be left behind, to leave no one behind on account of ethnicity, gender, geography, disability, or other status. So we are now going to look at it to extend it to a broader spectrum, to include disabled people and the rest of society. And the uh, Secretary General's high-level panel has also made significant gains, highlighting 19 specific references to disability, and thereby addressing the shortcomings which were contained in the Millennium, Develop uh, Millennium Declarations. Now, I want to look at the impact of disability on society. Disability has both a direct and indirect cost on society. We get to realize that 25% of the population in an area is affected by disability in a very direct way. And the indirect cost has to do in the form of opportunity cost by way of income. A person that would be a disabled person for goes, uh, is not able to join mainstream, the, the mainstream labor market because of disability, and that results in income lost. And the direct cost is also manifest in the form of travel access, the limitation that you are not able to engage in society and all these other elements. Next. And the similar study that was conducted in India in 1991 says that um, the cost of disability is about uh, it's perhaps four to five times what was recorded in, as early back out of the 32 million disabled people in India back in 1991. Definitely the figure must have increased. But for the fact that disabled, the level of documentation and statistics on disabled people is missing, we still do not get an accurate picture of what the real figure really looks like. A similar study was conducted in Tanzania. That showed that um, the, the consumption rate of households with a disabled person was almost 60% less than the national average. And the World Bank says that the impact of long-term disabilities accounted for a little over 30% of the disability-adjusted life years on a, global, on a global scale. And one of the things about disability is that the indirect cost is that much of the cost is borne by the female members of society. For instance, in my case, I had to get a female caregiver. That was with me all the way through for nine years. That's foregone income. And the other part of it, the exclusion, has an inadvertent nature. Suppressing the... Uh, okay. Disability suppresses the, um, the, 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 uh, the personality of the disabled person, such that he's unable to fit into society and begins to lack that. Next. And what's the way forward? What are we recommending? Yes, we are saying disability is both a development issue and a human rights question. It's not just a dis uh, And we're saying that we need to hold governments accountable, as we indicated in the UN Convention and other um, uh, global declarations and mechanisms. Governments have an obligation, and they should be held accountable to that. And there has to be explicit reference to disabilities in all these issues, rather than implications and indirect messages, because this is a rights issue that is non-negotiable and imperative and to provide for both universal design in all structures. For instance, when I was coming here, this, um, in the case, in, in the most appropriate sense, universal design should ensure that I am able to access any environment wherever I go, irrespective of what is it. And there has to be a twin track to the approach towards dealing with disability on, by way of poverty. There has to be disability-specific uh, provisions and those that are disability-inclusive. Which ones, how do we make them... Uh, Make sure that some parts are very specifically targeting disabled people and others in, uh, deal with it in the general sense. For instance, a picture of this beautiful girl here. She has hearing aids, able to attend class, and all these things makes her fit into society. And my question is, why should we care? Why should disability be an issue at all for us? Well, 
um, there's something really very interesting, which a Greek philosopher once said. Why would someone plant a tree that he or she would not live to see? And I think it's just because the person is able to see into the future. So disability and poverty is an investment into the future. And as a matter of fact, as we continue to age, more and more people are becoming disabled in one way or the other. And you soon come to realize that the club is an extensive one that includes everybody, not just those of us who are left out. Next. Yes. So it's a challenge to our world and to all of us. And the final remarks is that, well, one of my favorite songs is by Tracy Chapman, uh, Sub City, which says we live in a world where there's poverty, we don't want to acknowledge it. But finally he says, give Mr. President my honest regards for disregarding us. So disabled people all along, as you go ahead, we just want to say, as you work out towards restoring po uh, wrestling down poverty, thank you very much, but we still need some more inclusion, not less of it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Georges? Hi. Um, well, hi, my name is Matthew Taylor. I'm from UNDP. Um, first of all, congratulations. That was superb. Um, frankly speaking, I felt like I was sitting watching a TED talk right there. That was really, really good. Um, and an absolutely critical, critical uh, subject area and powerfully told um, through personal experience and nothing is going to have more of an impact than that. So well done. Um, on the substance, um, it was very solid. Uh, well-structured, very logical, well-ordered. Um, I really like the, the detailed focus on uh, moving past um, medical perceptions of people with disabil disabilities and looking at it from a, a social perspective. Um, I mean, I, <laughs> I did a little work with UNICEF myself a few years ago, and I won't say which country it is, but... Um, they, uh, you know, there was a, <laughs> we had a center for people with disabilities um, and, uh, and the government agency put it together and they didn't even put a ramp on the outside of the building for people who had wheelchairs. So clearly there is a huge educational issue there that needed to be done and this is something also. But inclusion in society, absolutely right, exclusion. Um, I mean, in some countries, in, stigma is, is, is a huge issue. Um, in some places, people are, are written off uh, as for being cursed, and in some cases, left to die. Um, it's an extremely important issue. Um, and obviously, they are denied uh, access to the health care and the education that they need to break through, uh, uh, to break out of poverty. Um, I read some WHO UNICEF figures uh, not so long ago. I think it said 575 million people with some form of disability live in the developing world. Uh, sorry, live under the poverty line. Um, it's, it's a huge issue. Um, I really like, um, I really like uh, your slide on why should I care. I really like the, the wonderful quote at the end. Um, I think uh, I would say one thing regarding the post-2015 development agenda. Um, I would come up with a really clear-cut sub-aim you know, with solid facts and statistics, punchy and aspirational, um, to go under one of these 12 goals that have been recommended by the high-level panel. Um, that's what I would do, and create a real visionary, aspirational aim uh, for people who are doing wonderful work in raising awareness on stuff like this worldwide to aspire to, uh, work together, come around, and advocate for aggressively and loudly. Uh, keep banging the drum. Fantastic job. Thanks very much. Just one uh, small comment. Um, First of all, I'd like to mention about uh, appreciation of responding to re invitation to Korea by making long journey from Ghana, Africa. And then you made a very, very impressive and moving presentation and then also addressed uh, the issues, which is very important but still neglected in international society, the issue of disability. And also, of course, your assistant brother made a very weak, uh, you know, the what, role of division in presentation. And then you, your presentation and research work also addressed very uh, the good uh, measures that should be linked to post MDGs. And then, then definitely you have argued about the issues of inclusiveness. So that's great contribution. But uh, if I allow me, uh, if you allow me to add on just uh, one uh, comment. As a research paper, uh, it, your uh, arguments could be uh, more effectively delivered if you based on some statistics and data. So maybe in, the, in, in any other cases, if you present same issues, 
would like to, I'd like to ask you to uh, reinforce some evidences and statistical data. But overall, your, your presentation and research paper was excellent enough. Thank you. Thank you, judges, and also thank you, uh, the presenters. All right, fourth team, Hua Ti Tan Kian, will make a presentation. The title of the paper is Assessment of MDGs in Vietnam, Suggested Policies for Poverty Eradication. Please welcome them with a big applause. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Hua Nguyen, and here are my teammates, Quy Hua and Ding Thuy. First of all, I would like to thank the all the organizers for giving us this great opportunity to be here and present about the assessment of MDG in Vietnam, as well as our suggested policy for the country poverty eradication. Um, here is our content for the presentation. So at the beginning of our presentation, I will briefly introduce about the topic and move to the Millennium Development Goals Achievement in Vietnam. Next, my other teammate will present about the profile and policy of Vietnam. And last but not least, we will talk about our poverty policy recommendation and conclude our presentation. In the past few years, Vietnam has made impressive performance to reach MDG and enhance the quality of life for citizens. However, there are still big gap between urban and rural areas. And through our presentation today, we would like to point out the problem that the country is still facing in order to reach the MDG one poverty reduction and social exclusion. And now I will start presenting about the Millennium De Development Goals in Vietnam. The first one is about achieving universal prim primary edu education. So the net, enrollment, the net enrollment rate in primary school uh, kept increasing, and the literacy of people from 15 to 24 years old, eight, uh, years old um, was about 97% uh, percent back to 2009. The government also kept investing more for education and encouraged poor students to go to school uh, by supporting the tuition fee. However, the quality of education and the unbalance uh, between urban and rural areas are still the big two problems that the country is still facing. Um, about the promoting gender equality and uh, empower, empowering women, um, Vietnam has successfully re uh, increased and balanced the number of men and female students enrolled and complete the primary and secondary school. Also, the labor force participation of uh, women was about 73%, and compared with 82% of men uh, read, it was not a very big gap. Um, recently, Vietnam's segregation uh, birth also attracted a lot of attention. See, the number of boys is increasing, and it threatens the balance between the boy and girl rate. According to one survey conducted by GSO, one of three ever married women reported that they had experienced physical, sexual, and mental violence during their life. Uh, for the MDG4 reducing child mortality, Vietnam has reached the MDG4 by reducing the ratio to two thirds. From uh, 40 per thousand live birth in 1990, the infant mortality rate uh, has reduced to 14 per thousand in 2011. However, the death rates between the mountainous area and urban areas are very different. Uh, the country has introduced uh, safer pregnancy as well as expand the scan of uh, quality in uh, reproductive health service and provide the measures for uh, quality service to the poor and other groups. After 2012, Vietnam has reached the MDG6 of controlling malaria and also the performance of uh, preventing and controlling SARS, H5N1, and H1N1 was also recognized. 
However, the barriers to HIV service, as well as the ability to sustain the, country, uh, the nation respond to HIV, I think the two big obstacles that the country will have to overcome. Thanks to the government effort, um, the environmental sustainability has received a lot of development. However, the water sanitation, biodiversity conservation, and climate change are still the three big difference that the country is facing. And about developing global partnership, uh, recognizing that our global partnership is a helpful tool to reduce the poverty rate, Vietnam ha has made impressive strides from uh, since 2000, uh, including joining WTO in 2007, uh, expanding the cooperation within ASEAN, and uh, involving in more FTA. And now I would like to switch to the MDG one, poverty reduction and social exclusion, the one that we would like to focus on and provide some recommendation. So according to the report conducted by United Nations in 2012, Vietnam has made impressive performance on poverty reduction. And as you can see through this number, Vietnam has successfully reduced the extreme poverty rate as well as the poverty rate. After 20 years from the country that was defined as the world poorest country with the GDP of around $100 per capita, is now turned out to be the lower and middle income country with a GDP of around $1,000. However, there is still a big gap between urban and uh, rural areas, and the unbalance of poverty among regions and ethnic is a big challenge that the country will have to face in order to reach the MDG one. And now my teammate will present about the country profile and policy. Okay, thank you. So in order to explain why we chose to focus our work on poverty eradication in Vietnam, let me first talk about the Vietnam's poverty profile. Although Vietnam has been making significant improvement in reducing poverty, chronic poverty and differences among regions are still remaining as big challenges for the country. And the highest rate of poverty is concentrated in rural areas such as the Central Highlands, and with northern mountains, as, as you can see on the map. And the poor in Vietnam are mainly farmers, with 33% of agricultural households are living below poverty line. The agricultural households also contribute to 65% of the poor, 73% of the extreme poor of the country, compared with their population share for only 41%. And there are many reasons explaining why the poverty came from agricultural households. The poor in rural areas, who are usually farmers, usually like like land holdings, they are in poor credit status. That is, they cannot lend money or pay their debts. They um, they have limited assets and lo very low level of education, and in poor health condition. Moreover, farmers in Vietnam usually have to face with natural disaster and other climate factors that may affect the uh, final results of their harvest. Another characteristic is that there are 53 ethnic minority groups in Vietnam, making up 15% uh, of the total population, but they contribute for 47% of the total poor and 68% of the extreme poor of the country. The numbers reflect sharply the differences of poverty between the ethnic minority groups and the ethnic majority, the king people. Ethnic minority groups are observed to have very high rate of poverty and extreme poverty, with the highest rate regions uh, in the south central coast, central highlands, and with northern mountains, as are shown on the left-hand side. Meanwhile, ethnic majority, the king's poverty, is observed to be fallen into the north central coast, uh, as on the right side. Also, as you can see on the graph, on the, uh, even that, like the poverty rate reduced significantly throughout the years, but there's still a big gap between the two groups, the uh, minority and the majority groups. And even among the um, ethnic minority groups, there are groups which perform better than other groups. The reason of the difference is it can be explained by the ability of speaking Vietnamese. As many studies mentioned, many people of the ethnic groups have very low level of Vietnamese uh, language ability. So the status of poverty in Vietnam can be explained simply by the different levels of education. Even though the country has had improved its educational system with the increasing rate of primary school and secondary school enrollment, as my friend earlier mentioned, but the lack of education still derives poverty. 
there is surely a correlation between poverty rate and the level of education. It is understandable why the ethnic majority, the king people who is more accessible to high le higher level of education, is capable of reducing poverty faster than the ones from ethnic minorities. And to make the problem worse, there's a high rate of school dropped out in rural, rural areas, resulting from their poverty, from their language barriers, and poor quality of infrastructure there, and the likes of teachers who can speak ethnic minorities' language. Also, the ethnic minorities are less likely to be wage workers. That means they are less likely to have contracts of employment, and they have no social security benefit. So in short, the chronic poverty in Vietnam can be seen as the problem of unbalancing among regions. The king and Chinese people who have more advantage in terms of economic resource and language are able to reduce their poverty rate rapidly and even obtain the uh, above, the above uh, standard of living. Meanwhile, the ethnic minority groups who have very limited access and face disadvantage in language used to rely heavily on agriculture and live in rural areas, are not capable of getting high education level, and thus, as in a vicious circle, they, cannot, they can hardly reduce the, their poverty. And that leads to my next part, that is our current measures in, reducing, in solving the mentioned problems. First, Vietnamese government had developed a unified policy framework aiming at eliminating the category of hungry household and reducing quickly the number of poor household, as stated in several, several documents as shown on the screen. Also, in trying to expand the MDG's goal to embrace our new uh, various aspects of poverty and deprivation in Vietnam, our um, government has built our own version of MDG, that is the Vietnam Development Goals, VDGs, with 12 goals uh, including targets emphasizing on poor communities and universalizing education. And one specific example of our efforts could be the national HEPR program, that is Program 133. This program mark, outlines macroeconomic policies that are required to stimulate growth with 11 areas, such as credit for the poor, healthcare, education and vocational training, support for ethnic minorities, etc. And a large, large portion of the funds have been used in credit and infrastructure development. And here are some uh, reasons of the program. Next example is the program 135 on social econom economic development in especially disadvantaged uh, communes. This program focuses on providing essential basic infrastructure for poor communes, such as road, small scale irrigation works, clean water, electric power, health clinics, school, and markets. Is also putting efforts in job creating and improving livelihoods. And there are also many other programs covering various aspects, such as the National Target Program on Employment or Program 661 on forest Reforestation. And moreover, Vietnam has been receiving support in every aspect from the international community. Or among those, the Official Development Assistance, ODI, has been playing a key role as a source of external financing and technical assistance to Vietnam. Since the year 1993, the amount of ODA pouring into Vietnam has been constantly increasing and covering many development projects. The donor community includes many developed countries, with uh, Japan being the biggest one, and other organizations such as ADB, the World Bank, the United Nations, and etc. However, we have realized that there are still some existing issues undermining the performance of these projects. Uh, first of all, uh, Infrastructure has been overemphasized as over half of ODA disbursement, while human development only makes up 14% and rural development only 13% of the total disbursement. Next problem is unequal distribution of uh, two regions. The rates of ODI per capita in areas where most of the country's poor live is actually lower than the national average. And that's the end of my part. My teammate will continue. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so my friend had just pointed out Vietnam's situation and our government's effort to overcome those. So however, we still realize that there's some problem in our system. So we have come up with some policy recommendations that hopefully can be applied into Vietnam and ODI donors <laughs> so that Vietnam can make more progress on uh, poverty eradication. Uh, so first, in for the Vietnam side, uh, first, Vietnam needs to set its goal in the longer term. Like in the past, Vietnam just set the goal for around five or seven years. And this leads to the 
quantity-oriented policy and instead of fo focusing on quality. And this also resulted in an unstable performance on poverty reduction. Uh, second, uh, Vietnam needs to improve the unequal development among regions and provinces. Uh, like my friend said that be before, like there's still a big gap between rural and urban areas and more and more people from the province, they want to move to the big city. And this leads to the imbalance in developing in uh, this area. And this makes it f harder to fight uh, over the poverty. Uh, next one, Vietnam needs to pay more attention to support production instead of uh, investing in uh, infrastructure. Uh, like, I know that infrastructure may push the economy, but with limited budget, Vietnam must focus on production like food and clothing, and then they can focus on the in in infrastructure. Uh, next, uh, Vietnam must be more active in building frameworks that fit the needs of each local. Like you know, Vietnam is a really long country, and each local has their own uh, geographic, climate, and cultural feature. And it's certain that one policy can apply exactly the same to every local. So it's really important that the government consider the situation of that local and then build the frame, framework policy that fits the needs of that uh, local. And the next one, uh, Vietnam must be more flexible in dealing, de de uh, with, uh, dealing with urgent situation. Uh, there are many cases that the solution to that situation wasn't given at the right time and in the end. Uh, the one that had to suffer from the damage was the innocent people. And the last one, Vietnam has to pay more attention to involvement in cooperation with international organizations. Uh, Vietnam still has some problems in our own system, so in cooperating with inter international organizations, we can learn a lot from them and we can get many support from those. Uh, those was the ideas for Vietnam side, and we actually came up with some idea for the ODI's donors. Uh, first, it was about the funding. Uh, it, is really it is really important to increase the funding, which is the most important step on re reducing, reducing poverty in Vietnam. Uh, second, it's about the building project. The project must be based on the needs of receiving country in this situ situation in Vietnam, not on the donors' uh, country benefits. And the last one was the spillover effect. Vietnam is still in need of technological um, assistance, so it is really important if those countries pay more attention to this area. Uh, so we all know that um, MDGs are eight international goals that every uni United Members country have agreed to achieve by the year of 2015. And so far many so far, many efforts were made to achieve the goal, but it doesn't mean that when the, this year passed over, all the effort and all the projects on that on the MDG's goal needs, needs to be stopped. I mean that every uh, government should keep on, keep on what they have been doing, and MDGs are the platform for the, a better development and better future for every country. And there are only two years left to, uh, for every country to achieve this goal, and I believe every country are trying their best to fix the current situation and trying their best to... Um, uh, achieve the goal. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> and now we'd like to hear judges comment. Um, thank you for your presentation and I learned a lot about uh, Vietnam's performance in MDGs. And your presentation was uh, excellent. And I'd like to make some comments. Uh, the progress in MDGs in Vietnam benefited a lot from economic growth, right? From 1992 to 2008, your average growth rate was 7.4% per year. But economic success poses, you have shown actually your, one of your contributions are that uh, the economic success posed uh, the challenges of rising inequality between rural area and uh, urban area and between uh, ethnic groups with different language capabilities. So uh, I think you raised a uh, you brought up uh, the issue uh, very uh, having very good implications for the post 
2015 uh, development agenda. Um, and I have a question. Um, the, you told that um, agricultural households, 30%, more than 30% of them are poor. Uh, you have rich uh, agricultural resource, land and good weather for agriculture, and still people there are poor. What are the main uh, factors of it? Uh, my just a hunch is that um, you are just uh, uh, graduated from communist or communal ownership of land, I think. So land ownership is quite important for um, incentivizing workers to make investment in land. So I'm very curious about what's going on in the fields of Vietnam. Okay, Thank you. So like, to answer your question, first of all, because Vietnam is live, uh, in a tropical area, so we are affected a lot by the natural factors that we have a lot of like storms and rain during the summer season. So that like actually negatively affects the the agriculture, and that's that that's one reason. And second reason is like um, the land in Vietnam is actually not equally distributed. There are like areas that are very richly. Uh, how to say, uh, they have a lot of lands and with like, very fertile, fertile land, like the Mekong Delta or the Red River Delta. However, on the mountainous area, they have no land, but like, they, they have no other way of living except like, growing rice. So that's why like, on, uh, in, in, in average, they are like, poor. So, so is that, like, does that answer your question? Okay, thank you for your question. Answers. Peter Beck, Peter Beck from the Asia Foundation. Uh, I, I just returned from Da Nang uh, about a week ago, and I'm going to Hanoi uh, next week. And I'm realizing uh, that I need to get out into the mountainous area, to the more rural areas to see, because I'm, I've been very impressed with the transformation, the economic transformation that Vietnam. And the fact, the reason I'm going to Hanoi is we're having a seminar of what North Korea can learn from Vietnam and other Southeast Asian countries about their development. And I uh, will try to share, we're trying to get the North Koreans to come to this seminar. So, as you know, North Korea is very friendly with Vietnam, and uh, I think you've done very impressive work on showing the strides that, that Vietnam is making, and I think you've identified the, uh, the areas that, that, that still need work. The one thing that I would add, it, it would be useful if you could uh, include in revised version uh, the Gini coefficient, the, the trend in the Gini coefficient for Vietnam, because that gives us a good snapshot of whether inequality uh, is increasing. And certainly the absolute poverty rate is declining and, and growth is very strong, but, uh, but even when you have those conditions, they, often you, have a in, you can have an increasing Gini coefficient. That's the only thing that I would suggest that you add. Thank you. Uh, an excellent presentation. Just a very minor comment for, for, for your uh, reference in the future. The, this session is marginal populations, and you have demonstrated and touched on the, the national experience in Vietnam about marginalized populations, whether ethnic or rural. So it would be good to actually put in your presentation that you are focusing on one country that you will expand on within the framework of marginal populations and how that reflects and could be seen by other countries as example of, of how to deal with those issues and at the global level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, excellent presentation and I will give you a very uh, short comment. Actually, I'm from Korea Action Bank, uh, the concessional loans provider and we mainly focused on the infrastructure investment in your country and actually the Vietnam yeah, actually the Vietnam is the largest partner countries for us but uh, what I learned from your presentation is that you just pointed out the overemphasizing infrastructure is kind of be uh, one of the problem among the donor community and I will take it and actually uh, we probably uh, think about the more uh, investment or uh, and not in infrastructure area, but more like a 
production area. So uh, I learned a lot from your presentation. And also what I uh, like the most is that you have balanced approaches uh, to tackle the issues about uh, disparities in terms of the regions and ethnic minority. So uh, thank you for uh, your presentation and um, well done. All right, thank you. And now we are closing session one, and um, we'll have a 15 minutes break. We'll resume the uh, second session at 11.35.